greeting to all, please. Uh, welcome to Cabinet. Um, we'll go straight into item one, which is the Members' Code of Conduct. Um, are there any declarations of interest from members? Stuart. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to the one community interest in the agenda is number 10, by a view of being the director of the Okay. Bernie? Um, agenda item number 12 because of my employment with agency. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay, so we'll make those interests. Um, item 2 is the minutes from the last meeting. Can we agree that I'll sign the minutes as a true record? Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Um, just going to. Um, vary the, the business uh, uh, um, for a second just to, uh, as a kind of additional item really, just to make the announcement which I think is, is really good news for this council, that uh, World Council has been shortlisted for no less than four awards by the Local Government Chronicle, um, 2015 awards, which I think is a, a fantastic achievement. We, we've been shortlisted for most improved council, um, together with three other authorities, driving growth, efficiency, and entrepreneurial council of the year. Um, so I think that's a really good, uh, good effort, really. And uh, uh, we we know that there were 663 entries this year from a record 222 organisations. Um, and as many people will know, uh, the local government chronicle awards are are the largest and uh, one of the most well-respected accolades in local government. So um, I think to be shortlisted for four of them is, is, is a really good achievement. Um, and I just want to um, say a big thank you to, to everybody who's been involved in putting those applications forward. Just to, um, just to, to tell everybody that the next stage of the judging process, um, the uh, representatives of shortlist councils will um, have meetings with expert peer panels to present their applications and uh, answer questions. And in the, um, in the case of the Council of the Year and the most improved council category, and we're in the latter of those two, the Local Government Chronicle intends to stage live judging on the day of the award ceremony itself which is the 11th of March at Grover House in London. So um, that will be quite a, uh, an experience. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed for that. But no, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, that, that's a, 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 real, a real kind of accolade, really. And, and I think, uh, obviously, we, we, uh, we look forward to the final stage. But just to be sure, this I think, for four awards, I think we've, 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 um, uh, we've been shortlisted before and won um, a couple of awards, but to be shortlisted all in one year for four, I think, is a, is a, is a great achievement. So, well, well done to everybody concerned. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> okay. Um, sorry for that uh, uh, slight digression, but I thought it was worth announcing at uh, Cabinet this evening. So, on to the agenda. Um, so, uh, under the lead of the Council, we have a number of items. So, agenda item three is the revenue monitoring uh, report for 14-15 month 8. I just want to make a few, uh, few comments on, on this. Um, first of all, I think that the main point to make is uh, one, of, um, uh, one of pleasure really at the fact that we have reduced the, uh, the overspend to month 7 overspend was 2.25 million. Uh, and we've now got that down to 850,000 in month eight, so that's um, uh, real progress. And, and obviously, still more to do. And uh, members will see in the report the, the detailed work that's going on around, uh, particularly um, part of adult social services and, and children, uh, children's services. But um, I'm really pleased that um, uh, through the, the, the efforts, particularly in re regen environment and transformation resources. Um, we've been able to get the overall council um, uh, overspend down to uh, to that level, and uh, we need to keep on driving driving that down so that we can uh, come in uh, on on budget and with the books balanced. Uh, so that's that's very positive. Um, the the other comments I wanted to make 
uh, are clearly um, around reserves. You can see in Table 6 um, on page 11, the, the, we, we have a healthy uh, projected uh, uh, balance of 16.6 million, but I think the, um, the paragraph underneath that table makes the point that you know, contrary to what you often hear from government these days, that councils are sitting on huge amounts of reserves uh, um, and balances. I mean, our balances are are quite healthy for a particular purpose that we put money aside to deal with the, um, uh, the remodelling work that we're doing to make sure that um, uh, if we have to lose posts, that we can do that on a voluntary basis. Um, and the people, if they have to leave this forest, can leave a bit of dignity and with a reasonable financial package. And we still have, um, as we know, one of the most generous voluntary settlement schemes in the um, in the country. And, and, and therefore, I think there are good reasons why we put money in balances for, for that purpose. So I thought that was worth, um, worth highlighting. And then I think, finally, um, on the final page 21, there's a reference to the Local Welfare Assistance Scheme. Uh, which sadly the government are ending this plan at the end of uh, this financial year, um, which uh, it's 1.3 million, which I, I think is a is a real shame because as as we many of you people know, this money this fund was transferred from the DWP to the council to deal with um, uh, uh, residents who are in crisis um, and to help with you know vital things like money for food and fuel, etc. Um, and this money is now being, uh, this grant's being ended and we're being expected to pick this up out of our own resources. I think that's a shame that the government have done that. I, I know in our response to the uh, local government finance settlement we've um, uh, made reference to this. Um, but I think, you know, uh, in an area like we're all with high levels of deprivation to remove um, this grant, when it was transferred to us initially by government to distribute, I think is a, um, a, a, a real backward step, I, I believe. And I think we were making representations about this to government, but I think, you know, we, we have a, a major issue around unemployment, poverty, and deprivation. I think this won't help us um, to, um, you know, to, to make progress on that. Um, you know, I, I have to use this opportunity as well to, to refer, I think, to the I think the pretty depressing autumn statement from the Chancellor, which, which um, you know, focused on further rounds of cuts over the next um, next Parliament. Um, you know, we, and I think it was the Institute for Fiscal Studies who, who said that we would ultimately go back to 1930s levels of public spending, which I think, for a civilized society, I think is a real move backwards. And obviously, I think we we, we have to express our concern about that because uh, we know that. You know, we've already made really difficult decisions about our budget, 151 million of cuts over the last five years, and to think that we could, you know, we're in for another five years of pain and misery just fills me with dread, frankly. Um, but um, um, hopefully, um, you know, we might have a change in the general election in May. But anyway, um, the main thing to, to uh, notice in this report, I think, is the positive uh, news about the overspend. Uh, so, if I can point you in the direction of the recommendations, page 12, item 17, uh, we're noting the, uh, the month eight forecast of a uh, £854,000 overspend, and we're being asked to note the risks relating to non delivery of savings within the report. And obviously, um, goes, always goes without saying, I think it needs to be said, as a cabinet, we'd be asking the officers to. Um, continue to bear down on uh, any uh, possible slippage in, in the saving because it is absolutely essential um, that, that we, um, we balance the books uh, and we don't repeat the, uh, the mistakes that previous administrations have made. So, with those comments, I'll move those recommendations. They agree? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us then to item four, which is the capital monitoring 2014-15 um, month eight uh, report. Um, again, a few, just a few points I wanted to highlight in, in, in this um, capital statement. I mean, I think it's, it's good news that some of the investment that we put into the budget last year is coming to fruition. So I'm very pleased that we've, for example, finished the roofing scheme at West Kirby Concourse. 
Um, I'm very clear, clear uh, uh, I'm very uh, um, glad that we've now um, completed the, uh, the work to work in our town hall so that staff make a lane can be relocated. Um, the other investment that we put into some of the other uh, leisure centres, Gibby Gap, um, uh, those projects are now underway um, and should be completed uh, this month, which is good. Um, the, the rest of the works to West Kirby commence later uh, uh, in late October and will be completed in April, that's great. And the 3G football pitches at Guinea Gap, um, uh, they're, they're underway as well. So that's that's great news. And the salt barn, Stuart, I'm told, is, is nearly finished, which is, which is um, I think, really positive. So um, well done to, to everybody concerned around those key capital projects. Um, just a couple of other points, paragraph 4.2, page 29, I was pleased to see that as a result of the reprofiling of the capital programme, we've made a, a, a saving, uh, albeit one-off, of 840,000 um, by reducing the borrowing requirement, which is always um, uh, welcome. And then finally, just in terms of the overall capital receipts position, um, uh, there's reference there to the work that was done with the local government association where they projected um, that we could realise 20 million from asset disposals. I'm pleased that in that paragraph we're now projecting a figure close to 22 million. And obviously that's good news um, because it means that we can invest that money in um, capital projects rather than having to borrow, uh, which has a revenue implication. So I think that's positive and um, you know, we need to. Pay, pay thanks to uh, say thanks to to Adrian as a cab member and David, you as the um, head of asset management, in your team. I think for the for the work that you're doing on the, on, on on that. So um, with those comments, I'll ask you to look at recommendations on page 32, paragraph 18. Um, the spend to date 18.1 million um, of the capital program. Um, we need to note the net additional grants of 13,000 of schemes referred to in uh, Table 2 and also asking Cabinet to agree and refer to Council the revised capital programme of 45.4 million in Table 1 and the reprofiling of those schemes referred to in Table 2 uh, amounting to £111,000. So can I move those recommendations over? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, on to item five, which is the collection fund. I think the, the main um, point to make here is um, that we, we're in the position of having a, a one-off um, surplus uh, of 3.7 million. I'm looking at recommendation 13.3. Um, I think that is, um, clearly that's welcome. And I think the, rec the proposal that we uh, transfer that money to our remodeling and restructuring reserve is, is eminently sensible given the, um, the, the major work that we're doing on remodeling at the moment and, and obviously um, goes back to a point I made in, um, in the first report about anything we can do to bolster the money available for um, uh, voluntary severance and, um, and um, uh, reducing any, any kind of compulsory element to the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, work we need to do remodeling is welcome, so I think it makes sense to um, to use that money to put into our remodeling restructuring reserve. Um, so I'm simply going to move all of those recommendations in, in 13, uh, paragraph 13, page 43. Are they, are they agreed, Captain? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, item uh, gender item 6 is the sundry debtor write offs. Um, this is uh, the latest in a series of reports that we've been receiving at Cabinet um, in response to the work that was uh, initiated by Eugene Sullivan into the uh, outstanding debts that the Council has. Um, you will see in the appendix the, uh, the details of the cases that are being written off. Um, I think it's important to say that we are we are leaving no stone unturned in making sure that we can collect every single penny of debt that we can, but there are, um, there are often good reasons um, uh, why we can't collect debts at 
for example, a person died or it's statute barred or older than six years. Um, so I think um, I think we um, we need to agree uh, this uh, proposal. Um, but I would just point out, just as uh, in terms of the summary table in paragraph two point one, although we've written off um, you know a substantial amount thus far, three million, we collected. 2.6 million either paid in full or part paid and another 1 million on top of that has been uh, referred to legal services so we are we are collecting almost as much as we're having to write off and i think i think the message from the cabinets um, tonight is um, again we should use every um, every effort that we can to collect as much of the debts that is still physically collectible in order to help with our overall financial position that's a, it's important that we keep the pressure on that. And I know that work's going on in that and, and the other departments uh, to make sure that we can collect as much money as we're still owed. And, and obviously, you know, you see some of these some of these debts do go back a number of a number of years. But I think it's important that we continue the work that we've done as a result of the Eugene and Solomon report, and um, you know, and continue to try and bring in as much money as possible. So. Um, the recommendation is that we no group laws and the debts written off uh, as detailed in the, um, in, in the appendix. So can we agree that count? Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so that then takes us to item 7, which is the notice of motion um, that was referred from council to Cabot uh, in the name of Councillor Gilchrist. Uh, heading the corporate plans and ideals in practice and delighted that Councillor Gilchrist is here tonight and Phil I think would you uh, like to um, introduce this motion before we debate it? Uh, I didn't want to go along particularly um, I know the, the atmosphere in the council isn't the best place always to deal with a notice of motion and this notice of motion suggests what I call a taking a stock arrangement. Uh, I also suggest that we look at whether the commitments and pledges were carefully and properly applied, which is the phrase I use in what I ask the cabinet to do. Uh, you know, uh, nobody can forget it. It's more than a year since the issue of the Lindell School was first raised with members, went to cabinet, and then uh, reached a particular point um, when Alan Callum considered the uh, responses to the issue of the closure notices. I think the year was a particularly uh, difficult time for all the parents involved, and I do appreciate it was a difficult time for the cabinet member and officers. officers. Uh, I say that because I went to a number of the constituted meetings, I'll come back to that, but I also know it wasn't an easy situation to address, uh, it's one which the outcome I don't like, uh, and I'll come back to that as well. In the discussions that I went to, um, and certainly at the call-ins, I referred several times to the report put together by the parents. And when I mentioned things, I appreciate you haven't got them before you, and you might like to get hold of those documents if you seek a further report. <coughs> But the parents sent a report to all councillors in June 2014. And in that report, it's, I'll quote that bit, parents have asked many questions about finance at meetings and provided a list of questions and concerns for the local authority on the 16th of March 2014. These are listed below and have not yet been answered. And the parents report then went on to list a number of issues. Uh, whilst some of those questions were difficult to answer because we were still in consultation and things were be, still being sought, thought through, the fact that detail couldn't be given and assurances given at the time parents were looking for them caused a lot of distress. The second aspect is um, the fact that officers throughout said they wanted to be open and transparent, and I know it's something that Julie Hassel said to me herself. Uh, both on the phone in December 2013 when I was first given um, advice that this matter was going to go to the, the governors and then to council. But I, there are some things that uh, are still very painful and still irk. 
uh, I'll cover those, and then uh, I'm sure our comments will be made. In the consultative meetings, one of the things I discussed with officers was how could we record adequately and properly the issues raised by the parents. The report that went to Canada in Appendix 6, the analysis, Appendix 5, Appendix 6, the analysis of the consultation, did uh, put bullet points in. And I'll take my share of the blame for that because I had a discussion with Julia Hassel and other officers about how could we actually record these adequately. How perhaps if we grouped the points the parents raised, perhaps if we grouped them, that might help uh, us all appreciate the key things that were troubling them. What it led to in practice, I think, and it's an issue of how to record things, was a loss of the sense, a loss of some of the emotion. What then appeared as just a bullet point with ten words after it didn't really capture what I think the parents wanted to get across, and I know they did try to get these points across at callings. There are these issues are probably going to be subject to uh, a legal challenge. And because of that, I'm going to not say as much as I might, because proceedings might take place, there might be uh, enough funds raised by the parents to continue <coughs> challenging the authority. And therefore, I'm going to be careful on that point, because things we might want to look at and put right might have to be looked at in the light of any future proceedings. But one particular aspect of the meetings really um, upset me, and it's one which members of the public were distressed by. And I'm not going to name the officer because I've spoken to um, officers about this privately, and I mentioned it in the callings. But on page 108 of the appendices that listed the points from the callings, it said, uh, in one of the bullet points, the chair of the consultation meetings was rude and brusque. Now, I've gone back through my notes I made at those meetings. I've had the benefit of looking at notes taken by a member of the public who made very detailed notes at that meetings. And uh, there was certainly some difficult points where that attitude came across very strongly. And I think that particular officer needs some courteous advice and some additional uh, word in their ear to try and make sure that they, they don't do that again. The final thing I want to draw attention to is that should a legal challenge take place, this will be done from a combination of money that parents are working hard to raise and may involve legal aid. But I want to flag up how that contrasts their fundraising efforts with um, dues at various public houses and, and at the golf club and other locations, how the work they're putting in to raise money for a potential challenge contrasts with the money and the resources this council has at its disposal. It's a David and Goliath battle. And from what I've read of, let's say, invoices that have appeared because of Freedom of Information Act on, on uh, reports that uh, produced by a member of the public, this council in one set of chambers in a public document is paying something like 70 odd thousand to that set of chambers for a series of things that are redacted and I know not the detail. But that, there's a contrast between the work the parents have to do to put their case and the resources of lawyers, barristers and full-time officers the council might put in return. I have no idea how that's going to end up and therefore I've only touched on that in passing. But my motion asked to look at whether we did do things properly, whether we did things carefully, and it finishes by mentioning the SEA improvement test. And that, I know we paid a consultant £10,000 to do work on it and produce an independent report, but, um, and it didn't, and it's a question of that for me. I must appreciate, I mustn't shoot the messenger. I can look at the report and they didn't like it. Other people looked at the report and didn't think it was adequate or cover the points raised accurately, as there is a danger of shooting the messenger because we didn't like the message. Uh, but you know, that is another aspect that concerns the parents. Uh, I, finally, I know that Tony you know, the has been listening carefully as he did at the meeting, and it was Tony's choice to not chair them, but to, to listen, which was a departure from previous practice. And I, I do appreciate it because I've uh, 
spent many years uh, um, studying these things, that the Cabinet of Member Concern takes these things seriously and diligently, and it's part of uh, uh, Tony's experience in life and work that he's familiar with these issues. So it's not meant as a discourtesy to Tony, but I think there were things we did that didn't work out right, and that's why I've got the notice and motion forward here. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to. Um, um, Ask Mr. Joe for advice. Yeah. Yes. Can you switch your switch your your yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just want to ask Sergi, just, I'm going to bring Tony in a minute's camera, and just um, uh, to give us some advice on, on some of the points you made, because I'm obviously, you know, I, I mean, I've read that it might be a legal challenge, but I'll just, Sergi, can you just give us some advice on what, how we should respond, if, if, if it's all to any, to some of those points that Phil's right? Yes, certainly. Uh, my advice would be that yes, I understand the points that have been raised. However, we have not yet received any notification on a uh, anticipated claim or indeed the claim itself. Uh, um, clearly, there are issues and matters. A uh, decision has been taken uh, by Cabinet in relation to the Lindau School, and reasons for that decision has also been articulated. So, I would advise that we don't necessarily speculate and respond to the specific points around a potential claim, bearing in mind that we are uh, on notice that there may well be. Uh, so the, I think the representation and the consideration should be to the issues around the corporate plan and the engagement issues that have been raised rather than specific issues pertaining to the decision that the that is as highlighted by the Council of Tony, over to you. Okay, thanks Joe. Uh, thanks for that advice, Sergio. Um, I will sort of stick to the corporate plan and, and, and the practice and the, the motion that was put forward by myself and in, in the Council and, and uh, the Lord of the Cabinet. Um, my response is that um, when Cabinet agreed to undertake a consultation uh, uh, on the closure of the Lindell School on the 16th of January 2014, in my opinion, every effort was made by officers of the Council to ensure the fullest consul consultation was undertaken with the wider community, parents of the Lindell School and staff. Between January 2014 and the final decision taken by Cabinet on the 17th of December 2014 to close the school, six public meetings were held at different times and venues to suit parents and a range of meetings organised with the Lindale School, their governors and staff. Meetings were also held with possible successor schools. I took part in all six of the public meetings. Some members of the council also took the opportunity to visit all five of the respective primary and secondary schools for children and young people with complex learning difficulties during the consultation period. The purpose of the various meetings was to provide information about the proposal and to gain the views of as many people as possible. At all times, we were clear about why the proposal was being put forward and what the outcome would be for the children and staff at the school if the proposal was agreed. Throughout this period, officers of the council were fully engaged in meeting with interested parties and responding to a significant amount of correspondence. The range of issues and questions raised were both complex and lengthy, and they covered finance and resources, curriculum and health and safety, alternative schools, and assessment of children. I am fully satisfied that during this period, the council demonstrated that not only is it a receptive council that listens responds and engages with the community, but is also a council that will ensure that continuing provision will be made in schools where the vulnerable are safe and protected. Members will recall that we implied an independent consultant to carry out this SEM improvement test and the report on this was provided to Cabinet on the 4th of September 2014. 
Section 4 of the report to Cabinet, dated 17th of December 2014, outlined in some detail those factors which needed to be taken into consideration by decision makers, including reference to the SEN improvement test. Cabinet also received an equality impact assessment on the proposed closure of the Lindale School. To conclude, I am satisfied that during the entirety of the process, the Council provided the maximum opportunity to be questioned and challenged in relation to this proposal, and that all information was put forward. I have no doubt that the commitments and ideals in the corporate plan have been upheld. Chair, that's yeah, just to answer that, um, I mean, I do believe that we were faithful to our principles in, in listening to people. Phil, can, can I just remind you that listening to um, what people say doesn't always mean that you have to agree with them. Um, and, you know, I believe we, we did, um, I believe we did go the extra mile. Not only did I read that report that you referred to, um, I visited personally with the cabinet member who visited Lindell, and we met with parents. Um, so I do believe that we um, we did uh, listen. Um, uh, I accept we came to a different conclusion than you did, Phil, but that doesn't mean to say we didn't listen. Um, and I will also just uh, highlight the, um, the the fact that it's referred to quote from the corporate plan, that I do believe our decision was based on sound evidence um, and thorough analysis, and we did understand what the community was saying to us. Um, so I think the, um, the tests that have been set out in your resolution um, relating to the principles of the corporate plan, I, I believe we were faithful to them. Um, and as a, to reiterate, I accept that we didn't come up with the same conclusion to, to you, um, but I think we did apply those principles that we um, uh, set out in our corporate plan. So I think that is our that is our response to your motion. Thank you. Chair. We'll probably continue to disagree. Um, I think a stress on whether the analysis was thorough is one we need to look at as well. I think there were issues and that they still rumbling issues about how the, the um, funding formula was created and applied across the various schools. But um, I'm not going to go anything that might form, as Mr. Chalmers advised us, some part of the case. So, so I think we uh, <coughs> just have to repart the issue and see what any outcome might be. Okay, fine. Well, I think, I think from, from the Cabinet's point of view, uh, we, we believe that we've met those um, requirements that, that have been uh, set out, out to us and we think uh, we, as part of the process for coming to the conclusion, we, we did, um, uh, to reiterate, base our decision on sound evidence and thorough analysis and obviously whatever happens, if there's a legal um, case, we'll need to respond to that in, in due course. Okay? Thank you, thank you, for, your, thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to move on, on the agenda now, um, to item uh, 8 under the Governor's Commissioning Improvement Portfolio, and it's the draft calendar of meetings for the 2015-16 fiscal year. And you're going to introduce that, please. Sorry.
the, the, the current municipal year that we're in with regard to the policy and performance committee meetings. Uh, colleagues will know that there are um, four policy all of the policy and performance committee meetings uh, scheduled for April 16. I think representations have been made that it might be better if the calendar was uh, lighter at that end of the municipal year. And that the, 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 these can be accommodated to, to into March, back into March. So with some rejigging of this, um, those four meetings into March 2016. Um, one other um, issue of note, Chair, is that uh, Colleagues will know that we've, we have traditionally, over the last couple of years, to done the, uh, the corporate plan. Uh, sorry, the um, yeah, the corporate plan at the, the uh, November December meeting with council, which is rather late in the municipal year, and it would make sense to bring that forward. So there is a proposal, and you'll know that it is scheduled in the new calendar for the 13th of July, 2015. In terms of setting our corporate priorities as early in the municipal year as. Um, so with that chair, and unless there are any other um, uh, questions or amendments colleagues feel are required, um, I'm recommending the calendar to uh, cabinet for a long process and to council. Thank you, chair. Okay, thanks Anne. Um, hopefully Sergio that won't present too many complications for um, uh, the uh, Business Services people putting those, just moving those dates. I think it makes sense to uh, given the, uh, the recommendations to uh, give us uh, give all members an opportunity to uh, engage in the democratic process. So uh, hopefully we can accommodate the, the moving forward from those, those meetings in both 16 and this year. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so, um, so it's just reminding me of recommendation C. Uh, any proposed amendments to the calendar of meetings and appendix two must be submitted to the Head of Legal and Member Services by 10, 10 a.m. on Friday the 13th of February. So that gives yeah. any other members an opportunity to put any other proposals forward. Right. Okay. So with with that yeah. Can those representations also be shared with Anne as a cabinet member? Yeah, okay. Great, so with those, with those changes that have been uh, proposed by Anne, uh, can we agree those recommendations? I agree, thank you. Right, um, and then on to uh, Agenda Item 9, Corporate Plan Performance Management Report. And Anne, that's you as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Yes, this is the Corporate Plan Performance Report, which we've progress The information contained in, in the report is always a little retrospective. I think the, the, uh, the uh, information that you have here actually dates back to the end of November, but you, it can be seen that the majority of indicators they are on target anyway. There are a number of exceptions here. There are three exceptions uh, where things are not as progressive as you would wish them to be. And I'll just briefly um, cover those, Chair. We're in three areas. The other NHS health checks, rates of children in need, and the number of performance appraisals completed. Uh, completed. I think it's worth noting, uh, Cabinet noting, that all of these indicators go to Policy Performance Committee on a regular basis, Chair, and as officers um, and uh, whoever is responsible for delivering on them uh, are usually the techniques to, to give an account of. Uh, you know, achievement against the uh, against the targets, but um, there is an exception report for for each of the three areas that I've mentioned. So for the, the NHS health checks, there have been issues there, chair, relating to data collection and the timing of when health checks are planned by practices, GP practices, um, and we do feel confident that many of these issues will be addressed, uh, can be addressed. And by the, by the end of this year, we will see an improvement in that. So that's clearly one area that we will be checking against. Uh, similarly, Chair, uh, for children in need, uh, there is an issue related to a new data system being installed, which is anticipated will be resolved. Um, although, uh, I think I would want to say, Chair, that there have been an increase in referrals through September, October, November, uh, which means that there are more cases in the system on that one. So um, the, the new um, 
the new data system should help, but there, there is more pressure because of the, the, the numbers that are coming through. And in respect of the performance appraisals, um, you know, we, we have seen an, in, an impact on these being completed as a result of all the work that's gone on uh, during the, the Future Council programme. But we do hope to see an increase in performance there. Um, it is unlikely that the target is going to be achieved in that one five year round. So I think we need to recognise that and say that officers are, you know, are working on it and are committed to improving that target uh, going forward. So with that, Chair, I'll leave it there necessarily the comments and questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, um, thanks for that, Anne. So, uh, I think we're just being asked to uh, note this report and the um, comments that Anne's made about the, uh, um, uh, the, the detailed indicators. But um, I think it is important that we as a cabinet have this uh, report on a regular basis just to check that we are on, on track generally as a council and all the key performance indicators. So, can we agree those to that recommendation? Agreed. Okay, okay, thank you. Right. Um, on now to um, economy, and item 10 is the community infrastructure levy uh, progress updates. Um, Pat Hackett? Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report sets out progress on the preparation of an evidence space that will allow the Council to secure development contributions through the introduction of a charge on developers called a, infrastructure, a community infrastructure levy facility. As we can see from the report, Chair, um, initial findings emerging from baseline uh, economic viability testing indicates that there may, may be, I stress may be, a potential to introduce a silver charge without undermining uh, development viability in some areas of the borough, mainly in World South and World West, uh, and for some types of developments, mainly housing and retail development. Uh, Any sill charge chair uh, must be worked up and tested alongside uh, the policy to be contained uh, within the core strategy local plan and must be based on the infrastructure uh, that we needed to support the implementation of the local plan. The charge will be subject to independent scrutiny Uh, and by a planning inspector before it can be adopted, Chair. Uh, the decision to charge a sale will, of course, be a key area of future uh, choice for the Council as any policies imposed by the core strategy local plan will increase the cost of development and, of course, must be balanced against the running costs and potential income from a sale. The report, therefore, Chair, seeks Cabinet's endorsement to improve the findings of the interim baseline economic viability study, which, as you can see, is a huge study and is attached to this report. And secondly, to prepare an up to date infrastructure development plan with input from all council departments, heads of service, external. Infrastructure providers to identify the types of infrastructure that a sill charge will be needed to pay for. And finally, Chair, once this work is complete, a further report will be presented uh, for final approval by full council, which will set out a draft schedule of potential charges, a revised infrastructure delivery plan, a report uh, of implementation and running costs, and a final assessment 